Whether we know it or not, we live in a world that shapes our minds and our attitudes. And one aspect of that, that is both so critical but also overlooked, is a fatalistic approach to life. Which means that life is defined by cause and effect. Things happen to us and we respond. In our early years, our formative years, if we've experienced negative things in our lives, dysfunction, abuse, hurt, abandonment, and the list goes on, that will shape our character, that will shape our attitudes, that will define how we make decisions. It will first and foremost affect our insecurities, which causes us to be vulnerable and in turn develop all kinds of defense mechanisms, a set of armor, so to speak, to protect ourselves. It'll, above all, impact our relationships, how we love others, how we don't love others, how we trust, how we don't trust. If you think about it all, this is very much of a cause and effect, an action and reaction type of attitude. Something happens to you, this is what happens, this, this is what, uh, what uh, these are the results in return. You strike a billiard ball a certain way, it'll always go in the same direction. You throw something up in the air, it falls down. You put your hand in fire, you get burned. And so too, our life attitudes, our very psyches are shaped in this fashion. Now, you may say, what's wrong with that? I mean, that's part of life. The answer is, it creates a type of lack of control in your life. Yeah, you don't really control your circumstances. So therefore, you don't control your reactions. Of course, a person is going to put their hand in fire. They're going, to, they're going to yell, oh, ouch, pull their hand away from fire. They may get burned, God forbid. And also on the positive side, something good happens to you, makes you smile, makes you feel good, builds your confidence. So it's always something from the outside that's impacting you. What, but where do you come into play? Are you just on the receiving end? Is it all about that cause and effect? Now we know that those of us and most of us go to therapy. It's, a, it's over a trillion dollar industry. No one knows the exact numbers. What is therapy about? Or at least what it's supposed to be about is trying to heal, trying to solve, trying to repair some of these pains, some of these losses, some of these betrayals, and trying to rebuild and build up our lives so we can have a more decent future than our past. Of course, there's extreme variations. There's therapy for very serious um, hurt and, and, and trauma. And there's therapy that's not as intense. But it's all based on let's fix the machine as much as we can. Now, therapy itself, there are also variations. There are those that are built on let's just damage control, try to create a little peace in a very ravaged life or ravaged world and others that have a more positive approach. So whoever you may be, and since I'm speaking not to one person, but to many different types of people, all of us have to face this dilemma at some point in life. How much is in your control? Can you do anything about loss, trauma, pain, abuse, suffering? And if, of course, childhood is critical because that affects us in much deeper ways. But the truth is it's also about adult life even things that are happening right now. Look, we're living now in the last, we're in the last year and a half when COVID became a reality in our lives. Last March. So what are we talking about? We're talking about March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Basically a year and a half, almost two years of uncertainty, disruption, upheaval on many, many different levels both outside of our lives and also internally, having to deal with all the challenges that this posed. So how did we deal with that? How are we dealing with it? I give the example often of swimming in waters. The waters, at times there's a storm, there are times when the waters are calm. When things are calm, we don't necessarily have to dig deeper because the outside circumstances make it easier. But when there's a storm, again, are we victims of this storm? Will we just succumb? Will we need to retreat? Will we need to surrender? Or can we learn to swim and navigate? 
And as I said, this question is not a small matter. It affects everything in life. Think of times when you went through some real challenge, some real dilemma. Should you move? Should you change jobs? Should you marry? Should you not stay? Should you stay in the marriage? Issues with children, issues with our personal lives. Very often we become paralyzed in a point of indecision because we don't know what to do. Or we just give up and just let whatever happens happen. We don't take the bull by the horns. What we're going to be discussing, and we are already discussing, is that you have another option. But this requires an understanding of how you tick, what makes you tick, and how you function. Because if you want to deal with things like this, you need to know what resources you have. And we can't know that unless we're challenged. Or unless we study and learn the spiritual makeup of our very souls, which is the focus of really all, if not most, of my classes. To dissect the anatomy of what makes us tick, the anatomy of your very psyche and soul, and see, do you have deeper resources? Now, we know we have an immune system. We have a physical immune system, but we also have a spiritual and a psychological immune system, an emotional immune system, and a cognitive immune system, which means that it's not just a matter of cause and effect, something attacks you, you either, can, either you can fight it or you can't fight it. That you actually have deeper strengths. We see this when the body is, God forbid, attacked by an infection. Look at the body's resources. It goes on the offense. It goes on the defense, but also on the offense. Not just to eliminate the enemy, the toxin, the infection, but also to create stronger health, to immunize us against the next attack. And the same is true that we have that same resilience and deeper than resilience on our spiritual and psychological. I like to call the psycho-spiritual, uh, 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 psycho-spiritual forces within us. And here's where we go to the idea of the power of the mind. Let's just discuss mind and emotions, the cognitive and the emotional faculties. The key difference between the two, when they're working at their best, is one is sub- objective, one is subjective. One is reflective, one is impulsive. And you can guess which is which. The emotions are impulsive, they're reflexive, and they should be. That's their role. Because they're always thinking in terms of how does it affect me? Am I attracted to this? Am I repelled? Especially vital when there's an emergency, you can't just sit around and reflect. You have to sometimes move quickly. So your impulses, your instincts come into play. But in a healthy life, equally, the mind's role is reflection and doesn't allow ourselves to be caught up and seduced and distracted in ways that can hurt us by our emotional impulses. Someone offers you something that seems good. Your emotions say, let's go for it. The mind says, one second, let's reflect. Is this really healthy? You do the research, you do your due diligence. And as such, you come to discover at times that no, it's not the the right thing for you. And the mind, therefore, guides the emotions. So a lot about life, I would say all about life's decisions, is some way a balance between how our mind is informing our, our hearts, our emotions, and our emotions are informing our minds. And both are needed. They work hand in hand. In the healthiest circumstances, the mind is the captain of the ship, the navigator in the waters, and the emotions are the ship itself, the experience. Children whose emotions are stronger and minds are not yet well seasoned, experienced, mature enough, need someone to protect them, because if not, their own emotions are going to be very vulnerable. As we grow older, the what real mat- maturation is not just chronological, it's not just that you become more, you're older in age, but also you're more mature. So not to cut out our emotions, that extreme is also not healthy. Just to become a brain, a lot of people who are hurt and have been hurt do that. They escape into their minds and they detach emotionally and avoid relationships because they they make them vulnerable and they can be hurtful. On the other hand, just emotions without the mind, what do you have? 
Again, you have a ship, but you have no direction, no navigation. You're equally vulnerable. And you do get you can get hurt. So we need that balance. So let's go now deeper into what the mind really does. The, not just that the mind is reflective and steps back and is able to look at a picture in a more objective light and get advice and consult before allowing the emotions in. You know, you're dating someone. They seem very nice. You know, sometimes you're very attracted to the person and you want to, you're want you ready to marry them. The mind will tell you one second, hold on. Find out more about the person. I'm not talking about being overly cautious, just naturally naturally careful, like it is in all things of life. And as the mind researches it and does its due diligence, you allow the emotions are allowed out to become more and more in control, but they're guided. Same thing like if you're offered a, a, a job or an investment. You don't just say, oh, this sounds like a great investment, great return. You want to see firstly who you're dealing with. You want to evaluate the very likely the ROI return on the investment. What are the risks? And so on. This the mind does extremely well. That's its role. Then you may come to a point where you now need to have an instinct to say, it makes, all sen- it makes sense on paper, but should I go for it? That's a challenge. And that is part of the process of how we develop things. Now, when things are not personal, it's much easier, of course, because your, your own subjective interests don't come into play. But remember, everybody can be manipulated. Everybody could suddenly feel seduced by a particular pitch, so to speak. But the more personal it becomes, the more emotional it is, especially in the area of love, relationships, and so on, that's where there's far more risk involved. And that's why it's critical to have that balance. So the mind, besides being reflective, has something else as well. The mind can look at something and with its objectivity, detach from the subjective feelings involved, and as a result, actually have an impact on the circumstances. So, to use an example, you have an athlete, the top tennis champ in the world, skills-wise better than anyone else, but then that person has an injury, or gets into a funk, or their opponent gets into their head. They start questioning, doubting themselves. The skill has not changed, it's the mind that has changed, the mindset. And the opposite is also true. You can be less skilled But if your mind, you're very confident, and your mind is in control, it can give you an ability to transcend the circumstances. So you can't change the circumstances, but you can absolutely change your attitude to them. And that's where the mind has power to actually change reality, change your reality. Two people are swimming in the sea, going back to that analogy. It's calm. When it's calm, everything is smooth. You can't tell who's a better swimmer necessarily. You probably could, but it's not as obvious. As uh, Warren Buffett said in general about investments, about finance, he said, until the tide is out, you don't know who's been swimming naked. So when things are calm, you don't know whose strengths and, and what strengths there are. Then a storm strikes. And everyone should be well, but just as an analogy. And what happens? There you see. The bad swimmer, or the one without experience, will not know what to do. They'll either just panic and fight the tide and exhaust themselves to the point of danger, of drowning. The good swimmer will say, okay, I know what this is about. I'm not going fight to the, fight the tide because it's more powerful than me. I'll let myself float. I'll go with the flow. Both are facing the same storm. The circumstances are not different. But the attitude is completely different. Another example. I'm using negative examples for the obvious reason. Two people are faced with an illness, an injury, an illness, a disease, end up in a hospital. We'll say they both have equal problems. The problems are exactly equal by both of them. One of them has family, visitors, guests, gifts. Every day come people coming to visit, praying for them, wishing them the best, and the other bed, the sad individual doesn't have anyone visiting. 
And they have exactly the same problem. You tell me what will happen. Now, there's no prediction absolute prophecy here, but a person who has that support system, it builds up their strength. It builds up their confidence. They want to fight. The person that doesn't have people visiting them, they lose their will to live. They lose their will to fight. It weakens the immune system. Now you'll say, one second, the immune system is a physical thing. What does it have to do with attitudes? But attitudes affect psychologically, psychosomatically, and even more than that, the mind actually generates chemicals. And it generates different forces that impact the human being. I've shared this story a number of times with myself when I was a teenager. So I had severe allergy, ragweed, what they call hay fever. So on a beautiful summer day, those that suffer from that allergy knows it's miserable. Your whole plumbing is stuffed up. Your throat is tickling, your nose is running, your eyes are itching. The whole thing is just extremely unpleasant. So one summer, I remember I had a severe form of allergy and to the point I had to actually go for help because I had like an asthmatic attack. It's difficult to breathe. So they gave me something that opened the, the passages. It passed, thank God. But then I decided in time, enough is enough. Let me go to an allergist. I went to Dr. Redner. He was a known allergist in Brooklyn. He did the usual test. He did the scratch tests, dust, pollen, including, of course, ragweed. And when the dust and the ragweed were the two that blew up, and I had another attack right there because I was very sensitive. He gave me some shot, and everything cleared up. You can't imagine. I felt I was in paradise, breathing clearly in this beautiful summer day. Basically, it was between the, the second half of August through September is the ragweed season. So I said to the doctor, what did you just inject me with? He said, adrenaline. So I said, so why don't you just give that to me, and I'll take care. Every time I have an a, a allergy, I'll just inject myself. He says, no, no, that's dangerous because you'll build up immunity. You'll need higher and higher doses, and that's dangerous. So I said, is this the adrenaline that we talk about, that when people are excited about something and the adrenaline is flowing, an athlete or all of us, when we get all excited? He says, yes. So I said, because I have a question I've always wondered. Why on Sundays I don't seem to feel these allergies? And Sunday was my, my most intense day of work because in those years I was doing something really unique, which I've shared, I believe, on Shabbat and holidays. My teacher, my mentor, the Rebbe, would speak. With, and, with, and it was because of, the, because of the Shabbat, we didn't take notes and there were no recordings. So we needed to actually remember it all. So Sunday was the very, very serious day of putting it down on paper, and it was extremely challenging and difficult. So I always felt that's why I don't have allergies, because I'm just not noticing them. Not because I don't have them. You know, when you're so busy, you don't even notice. So I said, is it possible that when the adrenaline is flowing, it actually creates some deeper control that's, that somewhat, uh, somewhat weakens the allergy? He said, absolutely. Do you ever see opera singers? Actors on Broadway, singers, performers, pianists, concerts, they can be on stage for hours. They never yawn and never sneeze. He says, how's that possible? A sneeze is a natural reaction. He says, because when the adrenaline is flowing, you have a type of superhuman control over yourself. And he added one more thing. You ever set your mind that you want to wake up 6 o'clock in the morning? So you don't need an alarm clock, you'll be up at 6 o'clock on the dot. How, does the, how do you have that control? Because adrenaline has a certain power. It's not superhuman as in doing things that are completely defies nature entirely. But it accesses deeper resources. And that's what's happening to you on Sundays. So I said to myself, oh, wow, unbelievable. That's what's happening. Is it adrenaline, maybe other chemicals? When a person has visitors... Or a person is experienced and has the confidence, the mind actually changes reality. Again, it's not going to change a table into a chair or a jaguar into a tiger or into an elephant, but it will 
change, that attitude will change how you react and actually your physical strength even. Which would mean as follows, that when things are going well, we may not feel the need for it, even though we need it then as well, but a practical application is very straightforward. Find a passion in your life. Find something where your adrenaline is flowing naturally. And that itself will give you deeper strengths to get it done, to face adversity, to face difficulties. So it's not about changing the actual circumstance. The, circum the storm strikes. COVID came its way. It's how you're going to react. And when you have that deeper strength, what happens around you becomes less significant. Of course you learn to deal with it. We're not talking about um, not being prudent and practical. But you deal with it with a very different attitude. First of all, a much deeper confidence. Secondly, your goals transcend those circumstances. I'm just using myself as an example. When COVID came, so I've been teaching for years, addressing contemporary challenges and issues, and here suddenly, a global disruption, unprecedented. So I went right automatically, that was what I am trained for, into that mode of addressing the issue, adding many more programs, and I saw the results. People ask me, how do you have that confidence? How do you have that strength? How do you have that that the discipline, it comes not because just I just, I just decided, it's part of how I identify myself. Uh, that's my mission in life. And I'm saying it very openly and straightforwardly without any arrogance. That's my mission. That's my adrenaline. And that adrenaline has served me well, both personally and also professionally. Find that passion. And that passion will help your mind focus on what you need to focus on. And in turn, will generate all types of strengths that you can never even imagine. It's not even predictable exactly. You just see that you can do it. It's the same thing with marathon runners. With anyone who's excelled in any given area, you'll see that there's something else kicks in when some, there's resistance. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. You have to put the work. It's not automatic. But that's the result of a type of focused mindset. So it's not just setting your mind to that. You really have to find that passion that, that draws that energy out of the mind. So yes, your thoughts can and do create your reality. Now, does it always work the way we figured, the way we imagined, the way we planned it? No. That's also part of the process. You don't allow a defeat or a setback to change you. You'll say, one second, I set my mind to it, and it didn't work out the way I wanted that's part of the same training and the same conditioning that you don't see that as a setback. You know what? I'll learn from what happened. I'll learn from my mistakes if that's indeed what's necessary. And I'll grow from it. In other words, you continue forging ahead. And it's all driven by that type of focused life. So I would say mission-focused life with a mind that's able to transcend circumstances. That's the formula for getting through anything. And being able to not just survive, but to thrive even in difficult circumstances. Look, we see people unfortunately go through tragedies, losses, trauma, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier. Same people, same similar tragedy, and yet people respond differently. It all goes back to this key element and formula. What do you have working for you? So in a way, we are like a tea bag. You don't know how strong you are until you're put into hot water. Now many of us, thank God, have been blessed to be protected from the hot water or from any such traumas. So in many ways, we're not even ready for it. So I'm not suggesting we must have a trauma or a setback in order to build these strengths. That's obviously the most direct way to get there. What I am suggesting is that even in times of plenty, when things are going well, it's critical to get to know your soul, to get to know what makes you tick. Just like your heart is beating inside you, your soul is also beating inside you. And it has tremendous, incredible strength that you cannot see until it's challenged. Like any resistance, you don't know how strong I am until someone stops you from moving, so then you have to force yourself to push ahead. Try, try, try recognizing your own strengths without any resistance. 
So resistance is what allows us to see and reveal and extract those emerging strengths. You have it inside you. So it's a great gift to be able to face a challenge and come out stronger. Now again, with a blessing, I will say to all of us and to each one of us, nobody should ever have to face terrible challenges. But in life, there's always going to be some resistance. So this lesson is for all of us. Those of us that do deal with something sometimes more difficult situations, then the lesson is even more acute and more profound. But it's always there. Your thoughts can create your reality. We're coming to Rosh Hashanah this coming Monday night. Tuesday and Wednesday will be Rosh Hashanah. So first I want to wish everyone a very happy new year, a healthy year, a year of strength, of success in everything that we are involved in, success materially, spiritually, blessings for those that need blessings with children, blessings in health, blessing for life, long life, love and relationships, whatever area in life you need, may you be blessed. The new year brings new energy. So in addition to everything we've spoken about, there's new energy coming into the system as well, into your system, to all of us, this Rosh Hashanah. So may everyone have a very blessed year, a year of tremendous strength, the least amount of negative experiences, but to know that every liability can be turned into an asset. So, in the name of all of our beautiful team, Meaningful Life Center, we wish you a very sweet and healthy year. Next Wednesday, there will not be a class because of the holiday. That's coming Wednesdays as well. But all the schedules are listed on, posted on our website, MeaningfulLife.com. Please check it out because there's many, many programs even during this period of time, this holiday season, focusing on the messages, the relevant and personal messages. And it's always beautiful to be able to sum up the year and say that even though we've had extraordinary challenges, we also have had extraordinary gifts, blessings, and strengths. Be well and please stay in touch. Love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, your suggestions. Pass on the message. Subscribe, your friends. Share. In every way possible, let's create the ripple effect where we can all access those deeper strengths and celebrate together only in beautiful occasions. Be well and thank you. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.